Good morning, everyone. Hello. All right, so welcome to Parasocial Relationships and Actual Play Podcast. This is a panel that is put together by the Comics and Popular Arts Conference, which is an academic conference that just so happens during Dragon Con. We partner with different tracks, we put together academic panels, and we ask them, can we please show your audience our panels? Um, and we got very kindly given some space in the digital media track this year. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and let Camille uh, introduce herself and also her paper. Hi, I'm Camille Butera. I'm studying sociology at Smith College with a focus on digital subcultures. Uh, and so today I'm talking about parasocial relationships in actual play podcasts. Could you do the next slide, please? Uh, so parasocial relationships, as kind of defined here, are mediated one-sided relationships. The way that they were best described to me is a sort of many-to-one type relationship where you have a lot of people who feel like they have a relationship with a singular person. Uh, and like a good example of this is the term was coined in the 50s as a response to the rise of new media such as television and uh, more popular radio shows where the wide audience would feel like they had a relationship with the host of that show because the host would demonstrate a certain level of self-disclosure, kind of self-disclosure in this case means talking about themselves on a personal level, kind of displaying what the audience feels as an authentic self and revealing details about their lives, causing that audience to feel like they relate and have a relationship with this person, even if that host and media figure has never heard of them. Um, and as I said earlier, these types of relationships arise as a response to kind of the audience feels that they can trust this individual because there's a sense of intimacy and reciprocity as well as the fact that they feel like this individual is telling them things about themselves. As you shift towards the modern era with the rise of social media and with the rise of more interactive mediums, these types of relationships and how we define them becomes more complicated, which is uh, the major point of this paper and panel to an extent, because as you get fan bases that can use social media, there is more of an illusion to face and face, uh, face to face contact and the ability to go back and forth with this media figure. So even though it's a one to many type relationship, there's a sense of reciprocity in it. Um, because like if I was back in the 80s and I wanted to get in contact with a popular media figure, I would have to go to a convention to meet them or send them a letter to the editor, things like that. But now, if I want to get into contact with a popular media figure, like a podcast host that I like, I can pick up my phone and send a tweet in like 30 seconds. So you get this more complicated type of dynamic with these relationships, which is why defining parasocial in this many to one type dynamic becomes more complicated, especially as you move towards smaller media. Um, and that's where I kind of come to quick definition of actual play podcasts. If for some reason you don't quite understand them, um, even though you've come to this panel, but there are generally podcasts where people are playing tabletop role playing games of some sort, uh, be it Dungeons and Dragons, Dungeon World, um, Genesis, anything in that kind of range. And they're based around collaborative storytelling between the players and the dungeon master if the show uses the dungeon master and they're playing these games for an audience. It kind of gives that illusion of face-to-face -face contact between the audience and the players because you're essentially sitting in on an intimate conversation between friends. And what's also really interesting about, there's two other points I want to make about these shows, which I'm going to be referencing a lot, so I wanted to set them up early, is what's interesting about these shows is that the performers on them have to play multiple people in a way because they're not only performing as their character in the tabletop game, but they are performing as themselves for the audience. Um, and that differs from a lot of different types of podcasts and media productions because you will have shows where the hosts are performing as themselves and that is all that they have to perform as or you have shows where they are reading from a script or acting as an improv character and so the character that they are playing is that character. They don't have to play and manage both personalities at the same time which can complicate the relationship that they have with the audience to an extent. I should also note that kind of as a matter of them being podcasts, they're generally independent productions which aren't sponsored by a big name media, 
for the most part. With Critical Role, they are backed by D&D Beyond, Wizards of the Coast, so they're getting more corporate money, but most of the time they kind of fall into this gray area of getting some ad revenue from typical podcast sponsors such as Casper Mattresses or Food Box Services. There are outlier examples, or and also fan money, but there are outlier examples like with Friends at the Table which don't receive any ad revenue at all and only get their media funding from a fan Patreon. So most of the time they aren't indebted to any larger kind of ad revenue and as a result there's more kind of sense of responsibility towards the fans because the fans are where they're making actually making some profit and ability to keep the podcast going. Um, can I get to the next slide, please? <laughs> this is a popular image that I used um, for kind of explaining the two and explaining these type of relationships because it is that sense that you are sitting in on a conversation, you are laughing at that conversation, but you are not part of it. You know that you are outside of it and that's where the things get complicated because the format impacts a relationship development. Be as they're serial shows, long ongoing things, and as they're very much rooted in self-promotion on social media, you have them making a lot of references to fans or fan culture and fan jokes. So you get this sense that you're laughing with them because you're in on all of these jokes and you're sharing in this experience but you're still not part of that actual conversation that's happening. You also get an element of this kind of feeling like you're part of it, even when you're not, um, when it comes to intimacy for emotional moments, because since these are generally recorded, improvised shows, when, char when the players are panicking over major character moments, story moments, etc., the fans are sharing in that moment of crisis, which deepens the bond between the creator on the show and the fan. Uh, then kind of moving towards the social media and fandom aspects of it, the social media allows the podcasters to be brought in direct contact with the fans and interact with them to an extent. You s and like these are often on-demand intimate fan reactions because so many of these shows get excited about fan art, want to share the fan art, want to share fan jokes and fan excitement about the show. So fans feel like these creators are responding to them and them specifically, especially if they get long comments or retweets or kind of sharing of their art by these creators. And that's the last, the fan art is another important element because a lot of these shows and uh, it ends up being promotion for these shows and advertisement for these shows. Um, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more, but the adventures, and they always say like, share your fan art, share hashtags about the show because it's f word of mouth for them and that's how they get most of their revenue and most of their attention. So they want that sort of fan engagement and so they're going to engage in relationships that will promote that engagement to extent. Also, it's there is that element of it's not all of them trying to promote themselves. They're genuinely excited that people are excited about what they're making, but there is still that element of this is good marketing that is happening with it. Uh, the last element that kind of goes into that of like genuine excitement and also this is marketing is you get this blurring of who is the consumer and who is the creator and what is public and what is private with these things because a lot of these um, podcast shows, especially smaller ones where the people on the show aren't as large public figures, their social media accounts and what they use to promote the show are often their general, their like private like life accounts that just happen to get famous through the virtue of being on this show. And so you get this glimpse into their intimate lives if you end up following them on social media. You also get that blurring of who's the consumer and who's the creator with that element of fan labor and also because you get smaller creators who get inspired by these larger shows and end up making their own show. So they're both a consumer and creator in this element. Uh, and so my general argument with all this, kind of piecing this all together, is that parasocial relationships and how they manifest in this actual play podcast fandom are representing a broader shift in the structure of online fan cultures, especially on Twitter, and these creator-consumer public-private dynamics. I also wanted to add a quick note on my methodology with like what tweets I reference and what I kind of talk about when I talk about fan culture. I went with a sort of um, fan first methodology because you get a lot of issues in the past of people citing fan fiction or citing very like unknown tweets 
in syllabi and papers and things and bring undue attention to those fans. So when I like cite tweets and when I talk about things and show them up here, I try to either cite from the creators themselves or cite from fans who have been retweeted by the creator and have already received large amounts of attention on what they've been talking about. Um, so can I get to the next slide, please? So my first one is the Adventure Zone. And so how I'm going through this is I'm looking at four different actual play podcasts as kind of case studies in different ways in which this type of fan culture manifests and the different ways in which you get creator fan kind of parasocial relationships from these shows and the different types of ways that fans choose to engage. And so my argument with the Adventure Zone is that it's promoting fans feeling as if they're able to contribute and critique the show. Um, and those two are kind of very much linked with fans. So in this tweet, it's from 2015, but it's about fans being able to submit items for Fantasy Costco in the, sh uh, the original balance arc of the Adventure Zone. I um, also should probably backtrack and say the Adventure Zone is a Dungeons and Dragons and uh, Monster of the Week actual play podcast run by the McElroy brothers and their father. It's been running for years. It's very popular. They were here this year. It was great. Um, but they're creating this idea of fans being able to con uh, contribute to the show through fan engagement. So you have Fantasy Costco. You have fans being able to email in an idea for a weapon and kind of stats for this weapon and having it show up on the show. Uh, and you have it as a thing that becomes actually relevant to the show. A uh, great example is a Flaming Raging Sword of Doom where it becomes a me. What? Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> I haven't listened to Balance in a while. Um, but you get this sword that becomes a major plot element. Like, it, it becomes an entire NPC in the live show that they did in Atlanta last year. And so the, whoever made that thing feels like, oh, I had a major sway in the plot. But you also get the fact that when fans use the hashtag of the Zonecast, they could become NPC names. And so you have this fan feeling of, oh, I'm part of this. I'm not just listening to this thing, but I am helping in the creation of it through engaging in this kind of fan culture. Um, there's also kind of the way that they socially interact on the show that makes fans feel like they can contribute. Because the McElroy brand is so rooted in this idea of a family to an extent, and so they have all these very specific family-based in-jokes and syntax and way of talking and kind of joking about things and fans become, fans start using that same terminology and fans start feeling like they are part of this intimate family experience through listening to hours and hours and hours of content. And actually that's something I should have mentioned earlier with talking about actual play podcasts. But part of the reason why parasocial relationships work so well with podcasts as a medium as a whole is that you are sitting in on hundreds of hours of conversations. If you listen through the backlog, you are really getting to know all sorts of facets of these people's lives as they want to present it to you. And often when they're talking, they're not always perfectly conscious of what they're saying. So you get this very intimate glimpse in who they are and what they care about. Um, and so you get this fan production of content for the show, which means that later fans feel like they can critique it because they've had a hand in it. So a really good example of this was when the first graphic novel released some test pages, you had a lot of fan debate over they didn't like how the characters were racially portrayed in these kind of test pages for coloring. And the fan response was enough that they went back and changed the coloring for that and later graphic novels. And so you had this fan feeling of, oh, we can critique this to the creator's faces and it will get changed. Uh, you could also get a lot of this with the creators actively kind of seeking out that type of information with fans, with uh, Griffin and Justin asking trans fans about how to best portray Loop because she's a trans woman and they didn't want to marginalize and, or tokenize that, uh, that experience as they showed it on the show. And so you get this thing, feeling of fans being able to contribute and critique and kind of this sense of not quite entitlement, but this sense that they are able to shape this show through the relationship they have with the creators. And that, um, can I get the next slide? And that's different in a lot of ways from a critical role where kind of I feel like I do need to disclose that I haven't listened to as much of Critical Role as I have listened to The Adventure Zone, just because I have a lot of issues with watching audio and visual at the same time. But from what I, but with the fan dynamic and what I've seen through looking 
at fan relationships for the shows, there's a lot less of this fan feeling as much as if they're contributing and critiquing it. It's much more fans kind of feeling like the success of the show is six of their own. And part of that is because of how the creators hold themselves. Because Critical Role as a podcast, as a show, um, because it's Twitch streamed and not just straight up a podcast, but with the creators on that show, they are media professionals. They're people who have established careers very much outside of this podcast, and they view working on this show as part of their jobs to an extent. They are in character for so much of it, and so they very much have this separation of this is my job and this is not just my private life that I'm also sharing about on here. And you get some of that with, you get more of that kind of self-disclosure that enables these relationships with Talks Mashina, like the talk show that they have afterwards. But again, that's very much something that you'd see on broadcast television, like an after the fact discussion talk show, which kind of again roots them in that professional status and this professional separation from the, like, from the fans to an extent. Um, and so what I have up here is, it's a random tweet that I picked out from during the Kickstarter where one fan was talking about how excited they were that the Kickstarter like already had a success and like how much they were crying over it. And Matt Mercer relating, uh, Matt Mercer as the DM of the show relating to that emotional investment in it. And what I was kind of getting from this and from other tweets that were very similar was this sense of fans not having as much of that ability to feel as they could critique to the creator's face as you see with the Adventure Zone. While there are plenty of fans who might critique the show in private, there is a difference between complaining about it in private and complaining about it to the creator's faces, and there's less space for that with this show. Uh, can I get the next slide? Then you get, so these are very tiny, so I will read them if you can't. Um, this is from a show called Skyjack's Campaign. It's a second campaign of the campaign podcast, which is the major campaign podcast for the One Shot Podcast Network, which is a podcast network based in Chicago, based around doing a wide range of different shows around tabletop gaming, not just actual play shows, but some discussing systems and so on. But this is their major campaign. It's run in Genesis. Um, the last campaign was about 100 episodes. Anyway, um, so the tweet on the left is from the DM of the show, James D'Amato, and it's reading, oh, sorry. Um, folks, oh God, I'm just gonna do this. Yeah. Folks know about the emotional pain and stress I'm under, partially because of the magic of parasocial connection. I open about more because I know people are invested in my company alongside me. I'm less speechless that some people feel it's appropriate to take my own anxieties and spit them back at me, in some cases by directly messaging me. Like, y'all knew about that emotional pain because I told you about it. And so my argument of the types of relationships uh, that this show is indicative of is it's a smaller podcast than both of the two that I've mentioned earlier. And so you get a lot even more of an intimate kind of fan culture especially on Twitter, which I'm taking a lot of my fan examples from because it's a social media site that is so open to interaction with creators and it's so easy to tweet at people and have this kind of context collapse where everyone is in one place. Because of a lot of past fan sites like Tumblr, like DreamWith and LiveJournal and so on, you were separate from the creators. Most of them weren't on the site, but now you have them so easily accessible so that shifts fandom to an extent. But anyway, going back to this, there's, with, and then on the one on the right is about James D'Amato, the DM, reading this fan discord and seeing jokes about his show and saying, okay, that's canon in the show now. And you get this certain type of relationship in the show and like from this fan culture on Twitter where there's a sense that fan culture is deeply embedded in it because it's not just oh, you can contribute a name of an NPC or anything, but fan jokes influence the canon of the show. Um, there's a really good example of this from very early on in their first campaign, uh, which was there is a s major uh, non-player character who is like a 10-year-old boy who is being cared for by all the player characters in the show. And someone had written a short fanfic where he called all those player characters uncles. And the players on the show had found and read the fanfic and decided we're gonna start using this term in our show now. So you get this sense of 
it's not just that the show acknowledges fan culture and is glad it exists, but it's actually participating and using fan culture in shaping the show. Um, next slide. Okay, so my final show for discussion is Friends at the Table. And Friends at the Table is been going for their fifth season's about to end now. Uh, they're wrapping up. They do both sci-fi and fantasy-based campaigns using Powered by the Apocalypse systems. And what I'd like to argue with them is that more than any of the other shows, because while is that they're demonstrating this blurring of public and private, because while Skyjacks had that to an extent, all of the players on it are media professionals outside of the realm of their podcasting to an extent. They're all improv actors from Chicago. So they have this kind of sense of maintaining public status on Twitter, where a lot of, whereas a lot of the players for Friends at the Table, their Twitter accounts are their private accounts that have gotten thousands of followers because they're on this show. And so you get a lot more of them like posting random photos of their cats and things like that, or talking about things that stress them out in their daily life. Um, and the reason I used this was it just, for me, seemed like a good example of Austin Walker, the dungeon master of the show, interacting with a fan to kind of produce some of his own fan content. And it's from his very, um, it's from his Twitter, which is comparative to the rest of the show, a very kind of professional Twitter, since he's the editor in chief for Vice's gaming department. Um, but it still is an example of having this kind of intimate blurring of like, he's talking about random headcanons and AUs for his show on his major Twitter. Uh, and so you get this, in addition, Friends at the Table, um, the way that they have their role playing style on the show is a lot less we're in character or we're out of character. It's a lot of them discussing what is my character's motive at this moment right now. And there's not as much of this back and forth dialogue and role playing as you get with other shows. So you get this more intimate glimpse into who they are as people. And so you're getting even more access to their personalities and their kind of persona of themselves that they're presenting on the show. Um, and so you get a lot of these intrusions into their life because they'll go off on random tangents about things that have been bugging them that day. Uh, on their Patreon, they basically have, like for $1, you can get just these like 20 minute long snippets of the random idle chatter that they have before and after recording when they're trying to like clap and get everyone synced up time-wise. And so fans, if they're sponsoring the show and if they're investing in that show, get that glimpse into their day-to-day -day personal lives. They also tend towards this referencing of fan culture on the show and referencing specific fans and developing relationships with these fans. So they'll call out specific fan art they really liked. You get them referencing a lot of fan jokes. Um, there's this one character where there's two different versions of him. And so there's uh, fan nicknames of Cool Ranch and Original Flavor. Um, and so they started using that term on their show. They also promote their official Discord a lot on there. And one of the things that's interesting about the Discord is that it is a large Discord server devoted to the show where most of them are on it and will respond to fans if fans ask questions about the shows or they have a large, um, a lot of them are really into wrestling, so they'll talk to fans a lot about wrestling fandom on the show and kind of, well, not on the show, but in that Discord and kind of have this back and forth where they're not just disclosing to fans about the show, but they're disclosing about their other interests and in their life. So here you're getting this weird blend of the personal and private more than any of the other shows that I've discussed, just through how they choose to engage in fan culture and how they choose to present themselves. Um, something I probably should have mentioned earlier is that a lot of how I'm talking about presentation of self is drawing off of uh, Irving Gothman's theory of self-presentation and basically his general uh, idea of the theory, theory is that we are constantly acting, that we have an onstage self and a backstage self and there is a pla time and place for us to be our backstage self and relax and recuperate and we have people and places where we can do that but for the most part we are always putting on a show and using certain props to an extent. Um, all right and that's the end of my case studies and so kind of can I get the last slide? 
my general conclusion of why looking at these shows and why looking at these dynamics and relationships and kind of fan culture around these shows and how fans feel that they can relate to these creators matters because we are in an era in which our digital existence is a lot more tenuous than before because it's it's still asymmetrical you still have major media figures and then smaller and people who are fans and exist mostly as fans of these spaces but these figures are now accessible and with that accessibility becomes a larger issue of should how do we prevent ourselves from crossing boundaries how are we aware of these boundaries how do we set these boundaries in the first place and so kind of that from there is where I'm really interested in going is now that we have this space in which fans feel able and willing to talk back to creators and have the platform to do so how do you set those boundaries and how you maintain them especially if these are like the creators private not private but like not supposed to be professional media accounts where they're getting fans are accessing them and you also get this issue as I mentioned earlier of who is a creator and who's a consumer it's in our digital era you can make anything you want if I really wanted to make a podcast I could find a mic and find a friend and start writing up scripts and start writing up outlines of the show I wanted to do and I could put it out there if I found a good way to promote myself, read a couple of self-help uh, guides on how to do it, I could make something or I could start a webcomic and I could get following from the webcomic from the people, followers that I already have on Twitter and I could promote it on there and so on. It is so easy to make things and be someone who makes things and it's easy to share that now and so we come into this place where everyone is creating something and everyone is promoting ourselves and that blurs who we can talk to and how and that's always a place of concern not because people should be kept from creating but because people now feel entitled to more intimate aspects of other people's lives because they feel that they are also creators um, and it's I'm also not going to say that these types of relationships aren't important fans need this type of parasocial relationship and parasocial investment in their shows to have that same sense of emotional resonance to feel that same sort of resonance with the plot lines that are happening fans need to feel invested to have a fan culture and these relationships are a major cornerstone of that thing so it's just very complicated bundle of things of how do we set boundaries and how do we know boundaries when everyone's boundaries and everyone's ways of interacting are different in these new online spaces? Thank you. Hi, drop the phone. All right, so what that was wonderful. I loved that so much. Um, so we're gonna open it up for questions. Uh, we have about uh, 30 minutes questions so we can have really good discussion about what just happened. So anybody have any questions from the audience? All right. Um, you made a really good comment at the start about comparing the spaces that we're having these relationships in with the 80s when um, public figures were more distant. Um, have you looked at comparing and contrasting the cr this sort of space with the patronage of times a little bit before that, like in the 18th century and René Sonsera? that type of thing when, um, for example, vanity publishing and um, actual patronage were uh, very integrated with the artist's lives? No, I haven't. I mean, it's something that I definitely thought about because Patreon is basically an extension of that old type of, um, old type of having people contribute to an artist but instead of it being like one major patron that an artist has you've got lots of smaller people pitching in a dollar to five dollars or more um, so it's not something that I've specifically looked at and thought about in depth but it's definitely something I've kind of had at the back of my mind I'm also one thing that I'd love to get a chance to compare in the future is going through old comics letters to the editors and like si old sci-fi magazines and things like that and comparing it to the fan discourse because um, kind of veering away from podcasts but more into comics fandom you see a lot of similarities in how 
those two operated, it just moves a lot more quickly now. Uh, so actually a quick comment based on uh, what you just said. Um, uh, that's happening uh, even faster, I think, in comics fandom now. Uh, just as an example, uh, Karen Gillan, the writer of The Wicked and the Vine, uh, Die, some other, uh, a really great run on uh, Journey to Mystery. Um, he, it, for Die, he's created an RPG to kind of go along with the comic. And he put up a beta, and he started a Discord that he is active in for the RPG that he's created. So he's just chatting with people about making this game. So you know, traditional comics publishing is going even further in that direction, or at least he is. This, this, is, this is terrifying. Um, <laughs> Uh, I appreciate that you ended with uh, boundaries, uh, talking, mentioning boundaries. Um, a thing that I've noticed both on Critical Role and also on the entirely non-geek related uh, YouTube channels that my teenagers watch, uh, that the hosts of these, Matt Mercer and then the hosts of these YouTube channels, will end the show frequently with the words, I love you. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on I mean, there, there's sort of a buyer beware aspect on the fan side, but what are your thoughts on who's responsible for maintaining that boundary? I, mm, that's a, a tricky thing because it's, I honestly, it's on both sides because from the content creator's perspective, saying things like, hi everyone, and saying, I love you at the end of the show, they genuinely do feel that because these are people who are helping them continue to create what they love and so there's a sense of we really do care about our fans and so there's a sense of they need to of them needing to make sure that they don't step over boundaries with fans and how they talk to and kind of employ the use of fan labor because I've seen um, actually going back to critical role I've seen a lot of things about how a lot of people are not great, hap very happy with how they do the transcription process because it's very much a fan-run project where fans, is it not fan? Oh, good. Okay. Okay, so this is new. I'm not super based, but earlier before they got professionals, it was very much a fan-run thing where fans didn't receive any monetary compensation for putting in hours and hours of work to make something accessible that should be kind of be accessible. Um, but then on the fan side, it's also on the fans to not cross a lot of boundaries by pestering them about their personal lives and asking them questions about their relationships and very intimate things that they don't want to share. So it's it, it goes two ways, I think, pretty much. And it's just on both parties to be aware of that need for a line. And But who should set the boundaries is probably, it should be the creators who set the boundaries of what they think is accessible and that will dif differ from creator to creator based on how happy they are about sharing about themselves. I also want to add to that that I feel like a, a lot of these like podcasts do a lot of like community building and like we're, we're you're, this is a safe space, you're here with us and all of that stuff. And I feel like a lot of them are encouraging that parasocial relationship, but also I feel like that could be a form of taking advantage. Like you're making, you, you are creating a community and making people like enjoy and connect with what you are doing. But sometimes like saying I love you at the end of every podcast, like people are creating, like some people can't make a disconnect between this not being my best friend, you know? And I feel like I, that, Yes, your podcast is going to be really popular. You're creating that relationship, but it could be a form of taking advantage, you know, to make your podcast very popular. Right. Um, just to, to write off that for a second, um, another example that I've really in, uh, that I've actually enjoyed, aside from the "I love you," um, what Culture Gaming uh, specifically does a lot of mental health exercises at the end of. I know things are hard, but. So, so that's another example that I'm seeing aside from just the, the parasocial connection. Uh, Question-wise, though, what I'm curious about, and I may have missed this at some point, I apologize, um, a lot of the personas that we're seeing for, for podcast or, or social connection are based on the premise of, you're, we're like you. Mm -hmm. you. 
you we are similar it's okay uh what are your feelings on the the connect or the the way that this influences the dynamic um hmm. I'm trying to think so my first thing is like the word like you thing is that it's uh, it's very authentic to an extent because so much of many of these podcasts are coming right out of fan culture which makes the relationships that they have with fans part of I guess I forgot to mention this. One of the things that makes it so interesting, these relationships with fans, is they're coming straight from fan culture. They're used to this type of interaction because they're on the other end of it, which makes it sometimes harder to set boundaries because they're so used to being on that other end of it, like I said. So I think that the we're like you element is accidental in promoting a lot of kind of boundary crossing on both sides just because a lot of people haven't taken consideration oh, there are power dynamics here just because they're not used to having to deal with those power dynamics on the side that they're on. Hi, this thing is amazing. I'm taking it home with me. <laughs> I have been granted the cube. <laughs> it's been really, really interesting to watch the Adventure Zone fandom kind of go through this when, as a fan of Welcome to Night Vale back in its heyday mm -hmm. in... 2012 and 2013 to see the approach that Joseph Fink and the other creators took which was not to produce any art of their characters specifically and just be like go nuts with your in own interpretation this is your sandbox you get to play in it but I also remember him having to step in at some point because there were a lot of people who naturally headcanon the host Cecil Baldwin as white and there was a significant tension of other people mm -hmm. who had canoned him as a person of color. And there was a lot of argument from certain very, very vocal people saying that Cecil being white was canon. And then Joseph Fink came out and said, I never said that Cecil was white. Cecil's definitely not white on his Twitter. And that just blew people's minds. So I guess my question is, I've seen a lot of Critical Role and Taz art from the sidelines, and how do you think creators draw that boundary between like official art while still creating a space for fan art and fan content and fan headcanons? Hmm. So I mean, I think part of it is that fans will headcanon and will change things based on how much they want to. That's a thing that you see with a lot of fan culture like coming out of AO3 and Tumblr and so on, where fans will straight up ignore canon if they feel like they want to. Um, so that that's part of it. There's also part of it that there's an element um, for these shows where they kind of need to make that official art because they want to have merchandise to sell. And that's where part of the revenue can come from. So I think that there's an extent of them creating semi-official designs and saying, this is how we as players imagine our characters, but you can imagine them differently if you find an element that you relate to. So it's a tricky space because different people are going to have, different shows will have different takes on how to engage with this kind of fan creation of designs versus semi-official designs. So. Sorry, I didn't fully answer it. It's just it's one of those things where it's a case by case basis of how these creators want to go about creating semi official art or official art. Question? Yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask if uh, <coughs> in your research if you found that um, if exploitation of parasocial relationships is like a considerable problem or whether it's, it's growing or shrinking because I've, I've, I've noticed like wh what tends to happen on social media is like usually smaller groups don't abuse it like this the smaller more family runner if it's just like friends doing a thing but you also find a lot of like businesses making twitters and going we're gonna have an art contest and it winds up just being free promotion for them and just they get a bunch of unpaid art and I, I didn't know if like that had become like a, a rising issue or if it's just kind of just the in the background thing I think that a lot of the times, like, the exploitation that comes out of it is not specifically around art, because when a lot of these shows, at least that I see using art, are commissioning art, or they're paying fans 
for certain types of fan labor that are engaging in, like Friends at the Table is an example, does pays fans for their transcription. There's like an entire Google, s uh, there's an entire Discord server and Google spreadsheet set up so that fans can keep track of their hours and like they get paid through the Patreon for it. So there's less of this kind of economic parasocial exploitation that I see and most of the worries around these types of exploitation come in the form of fans becoming close to people on the show and the worries about kind of those power dynamics there but that's also something that I don't actually see a ton of it's just people asking too many invasive questions most of the time next question nobody <laughs> anything at all guys we got 20 minutes <laughs> Bueller? Oh, there. Uh, sorry if I missed this. I just got here. Um, and if, I, if I've asked a re repetitive question, sorry to everybody. But uh, <coughs> as a creator, what can I do uh, to make sure that I'm not, you know, uh, inadvertently exploiting a power dynamic, right? Uh, where, where we are building community and you know, we, we engage a lot with our with our fans. Uh, how do we how do we make sure to not kind of step into uh, a situation where we shouldn't be, right? Sorry, I'm just yeah. Um, I think part of it is, as I was saying earlier, this kind of creating of boundaries to some extent like if there are places that you don't want things that you don't want to talk about fans about such as not safe for work things etc etc you don't want them to send you their explicit fan fiction about something you're making being able to set those and setting them early like if you have a discord server for your fans something that i see in a lot of like official podcast discord servers is creating these rules of conduct straight off the bat about what can and cannot be shared in this server and the types of discussions that are not allowed in this space and saying that if you want to have these discussions you can go have them in private away from us but we don't want to engage in them and so kind of just straight off the bat setting these kind of guidelines for what you're concerned about and especially around if you're uh, interacting with younger fans and so on so just this creation of rules and what you think that you as a creator are not comfortable talking about with fans or with people who you feel that you have some degree of almost influence over and also making sure that fans to an extent know those boundaries. Sorry, that was a bit rambling and disjointed at the end. I think to add to that too, I think that to just be aware of kind of your place in in what you're doing, like be aware that there is kind of like that there is a power dynamic there, and that like um, like if you are going to be asking your fans something or telling them something that you understand that like kind of think about it as if you're like a teacher and like you have students, you know, like wh what would you feel like feel comfortable talking to your students about? But I also understand that if you're like a smaller creator with a smaller fan base that you want to share as much as possible with them, like you want it to be like a family or you want it to be like, feel like they also own part of this. But I think that you just have to kind of be aware of, of what you're willing to share of your product with them, so. Yeah, actually kind of tagging onto that, it's, um it's the viewing yourself as your fans are going to view as an expert on whatever mm -hmm. you're saying and they're going to take your opinions and your thoughts and what you're saying with a lot more respect than they might with just someone from your friend because for you for them you're a p person who is a respected figure because you're on some sort of media it's basically the same thing that's happening with me right here uh, in the rest of the convention, I am a very normal person. I am an <laughs> undergraduate in college who just happens to spend a lot of time thinking about digital media and culture. But because I am presenting on this panel, you are all viewing me as an expert opinion on this thing. Yeah. And thank you for that. Questions? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> you okay? <laughs> 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 okay, um, so w we've mentioned Discord several times and it brought to mind the, the fact that there's a, another level outside of just fan, uh, which is moderator. 
Um, and that is a intensive level of labor as far as I've ever seen by examples. Uh, what are your thoughts on that additional level of relationship? Because equally, the, the, the producers of content are putting an enormous amount of trust in a moderator yeah. to control their interests. Yeah. So what I see a lot with <laughs> moderators to an extent from the few discords that I'm in and also like having been friends with moderators on various discords is a lot of times moderators are people who are prominent, in, prominent enough in the span community to the fact that they form actual friendships with these content creators. Um, is what I see a lot. Not all moderators are from kind of having these people who are friends and want care a lot about yourself and care a lot about this community, but I do see a lot of them being in that kind of space. And so it's hard because these are people that the content creators trust and care enough about to respect them. And so there's this sense of them trusting those people to kind of control these spaces and follow along the guidelines that they want. But then there's this issue of they're their friends, and so when fans in the Discord have issues with a moderator and a moderator's policies, there's always that concern that the people who are officially in charge of this won't side with the people that are s who are being impacted by the negative content, I guess. Uh, it's a complicated space to be in because you're a fan that's in a position of power over other fans and kind of making sure that you're unbiased especially if because with these like smaller communities, especially if it's a lot of people who, it's like a small amount of people in a Discord that all relatively know each other because you get the thing with Discord that you get with any other social media site where you're gonna have 90% of people who lurk, 9% of people interact, and 1% are super active. And so you, you're gonna know most of the people that are super active, and you're going to, as a person, you're going to have grudges against some of these people just because you don't like them. But as a moderator, you have to kind of quell those grudges that you have so that you don't, because you're in that position of power. So it's this weird balancing act of being a fan in power, I guess, and it's, uh, yeah. I don't really, just, I forgot what your question was, I'm so sorry. No, it's fine, it's, it's the thought. Yeah, it's a weird balancing act that you have to follow, and like, I see that a lot um, in other roles in fandom, especially around a artists who end up going big. An like, uh, example would be like Carrie Piesch, who does the official art for the um, Adventure Zone graphic novels, because sh her, so she's less of an example of this, because she's not actively engaging in fan culture at this point, to an extent, but it's still s this ascended fan status. Um, another really good example is uh, Dancy Nauru. Um, uh, she does a lot of art for the Friends at the Table. She's friends with most a lot of the cast of Friends at the Table at this point. Uh, she did like official art for one of their posters and so on. And so you have this person who is a popular fan to the extent that she's got a lot of people influenced by her designs and her way of thinking about the of uh, the, the story and the culture and the characters. Questions? Anyone? <laughs> hey! <laughs> so long. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I had like 18 heart attacks when I saw that happen, so. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> On Monday morning. Um, so I, one of the things that you brought up kind of early in the, po in the presentation was about how podcasts are very, like kind of a personal thing, like you experience them I kind of in isolation where, especially for a lot of us, we listen to podcasts like in our ears and it's like a very solitary experience. But I'm wondering how, what your thoughts are on how the live shows complicate the parasocial relationships mm -hmm. and how you now experience that as a crowd. Hmm. I think that, I mean, Live shows, part of what's interesting with those and part of how they complicate those is you have that ability to immediately react and Im immediately shape things. Fans cheering for something will s immediately sway the plot. Mm -hmm. So it becomes less of this, I'm listening to this after the fact and I'm influencing, I'm, I don't have influenced this other than tweeting about it and saying what I would like in the future and maybe they'll see that and maybe they'll be swayed by what I like in the future. You kind of have this agency in the here and now to respond and shape it. And especially as you're saying like with that crowd, you're getting people like large kind of consensus voting on how they would like to shape it. And obviously the creator is able to say back, no, we're not gonna go there or no, I don't feel like using this NPC in this storyline. But it's this kind of thing of 
fans actually kind of have almost a voting power now. And it's that kind of extension of when I was talking about the Adventure Zone, this fan ability to shape the show becomes magnified because it's live. Mm -hmm. And actually, so I don't know a lot about Critical Role, but I know that you do, or you know more than I do. So I'm very behind. You have a question. Erin has listened to a lot of them, so she um, So what actually what I'm really interested in is that you might have a perspective on, because I don't, uh, since I don't listen to a lot of it live, is do you feel that the Twitch chat ever influences the show at all? Exactly. Okay, that makes <laughs> sense. <laughs> One thing that I think you should look at or just consider is the early Critical Role, um, the Twitch streams, they used to read, and they used to have time to read the fan letters on the air. And I feel like that did a lot to foster when there were only like, you know, 5,000 of us watching. And you knew that one of the 5,000 was getting their r letter read on air and seeing live reactions to that letter and seeing them open the gifts on air. They don't do that anymore. They do it like once a year for Christmas. But that early, like, a that really solidified, like, you're part of the, you know, the conversation. And it, they may not be able to DM you on Twitter or respond to your tweets as much, but that used to be, like, you could write them a four-page letter and they would read it. Mm -hmm. And that was something that I think that the other types of things that you're talking about, this is a unique experience just for Critical Role. So. Yeah. Yeah. I will definitely look into that. Thank you. All right. Questions. Do you have yeah. a question? So um, the only podcast that I listen to that's been mentioned is One Shot and Campaign. Um, but it was mentioned that some of the creators are ending their um, videos or whatever with saying I love you. And I want to know your opinion on whether that is helpful and har or harmful in the context of um, it could be creating um, – it, it could be uh, – overly persuasive, but also in the context of uh, acknowledging that there is love besides romantic love, and I'm thinking along the lines of the Vlogbrothers Esther Day, <laughs> where they mm -hmm. take a day specifically. And so in these spaces, how do we promote um, the idea of emotional interactions with other people um, being normalized without being abusive or usurious? So part of it is like the I love you and saying that type of thing, it does matter because like I said earlier, they do care about these fans. I think actually a good example that I like is from Campaign where at the end of every episode, James says, take flight heroes. And it's the sense that the fans are part of this world and part of this story, but it's not saying I have this specific emotional attachment to you, but it is you are part of this thing that I am making. So I mean... Saying hi, everyone, has become a standardized norm in any type of kind of online media production, be it Twitch, YouTubing, podcasts, so on and so forth. People just kind of want to address all of their audience, and they want to say that they care about this audience. And so it's just finding a way to phrase it that's saying, I have this specific type of emotional relationship with you, when you're just saying, I want to address that you are part of this community and I care that I have this community and that you are part of it and that every fan that I have matters to me in that you care about this thing I'm making. So I guess it's this kind of thing of thinking about the exact phrasing of what you're saying and making sure it's not going to foster a relationship that you don't want to commit to. Mm -hmm. And with the case of Critical Role, I think the I Love You works because, as I was talking about earlier, they have established themselves as media professionals and as f they're not far away from the fan base per se, but they have this sort of social elevation that makes it so they don't feel as indebted to fans as a lot of these other shows might. So kind of also considering where you sit positionally with fans and how much you feel that you have to respond to fans. Time for one more. Anybody? Anybody? No more questions? <laughs> oh, she has one. Oh, oh, oh sorry. Ah. Didn't see you. <laughs> um, less a question, but an example when we were referencing uh, fans at elevated positions. Um, some of the Geek and Sundry content produced was uh, Shield of Tomorrow. 
and that one very distinctively had a, a fan that became a PC or a, a guest PC frequently that had not been a media presence in the past, which I found really unusual but interesting. Uh, um, Aki was a, a, a fan that became a moderator that became a super fan and was eventually invited on the show for, for appearances. So that's a, another example in your, your researcher movement of, um, of a fan relationship that actually elevated into show participation. Uh, along those same lines, uh, Andy Clare on uh, Friends at the Table was a fan of their YouTube Let's Plays, who was so big in their community that when they started the RPGs, he joined in. So. Yeah, actually, it's really interesting. Um, I listened to the first season of Friends at the Table after I listened to later seasons that Andy was in, and so it was really interesting listening to, uh, at the end of each season, they do a post-mortem where they just receive a ton of fan questions and answer them all, and Andy wrote in at the end of the first season as a fan, and so it's really interesting kind of hearing how they position themselves as a fan then, and then seeing them show up on the show later, and so there's, a l and be one of the reasons that that's able to happen is, again, these is, this is sm smaller media. Fans are able to get to know these creators and form actual relationships become these parasocial ones and through that actually become involved which is kind of incredible so it's this weird line of negotiate relationships with fans but sometimes you're going to get really neat and have really cool people that end up contributing to your content and like the things that you make because of these fan relationships yeah all right, guys, that's our panel. Um, my name is Jillian Browning. I've been your friendly neighborhood moderator. Um, can we give a round of applause for Camille for her wonderful presentation? All right, so um, like I said in the beginning, this is part of the Comics and Popular Arts Conference, which is an academic conference that takes place within DragonCon. If you guys want any information about the rest of the panels that we have going on today, we do have two more. I have programs up here. There's also information in the program about how you guys can contact us to be a part of the Comics and Popular Arts Conference. We're a peer-reviewed conference where you can submit ideas for panels or presentations or papers, and then you can be on this side of the table and having these discussions with fans next year. So we have this stuff up here. Um, also, if you guys have any questions, you can come talk to us. This has been our panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Huh. I think it's very vital. Uh, to rock around. That's right. On top. Uh, 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 uh,